Modern technology allows people to communicate directly. Voice and video calls, emails, pictures and instant messages travel directly from A to B, maintaining trust between individuals no matter how far apart they are. When it comes to money, people have to trust a third party to be able to complete a transaction. Blockchain technology is challenging the status quo in a radical way. By using math and cryptography, blockchain provides an open, decentralized database of any transaction involving value, money, goods, property, work or even votes, creating a record whose authenticity can be verified by the entire community. The future global economy will move towards one of distributed property and trust, where anyone with access to the internet can get involved in blockchain-based transactions, and third-party trust organizations may no longer be necessary. The uses of blockchain technology are endless. Some expect that in less than 10 years it will be used to collect taxes. It will make it easier for immigrants to send money back to countries where access to financial institutions is limited. Financial fraud will be significantly reduced, as every transaction will be recorded on a public and distributed ledger, which will be accessible by anyone who has an internet connection. Think of it as wills and contracts that execute themselves or dated proof of existence for ideas, much like a patent. Blockchain will become a global, decentralized source of trust, but not everyone is ready to embrace it. A huge proportion of trust services, from banking to notaries, will face challenges on price, volume, and in some cases, their very survival. Public authorities could find it more and more difficult to enforce traditional financial regulations due to the new possibilities offered by the Bitcoin network to bypass traditional financial intermediaries. Unimagined new networks will evolve to meet society's needs more cheaply and potentially more securely. Will governments, financial and legal institutions embrace blockchain? What will happen to the ones who don't? That was a nice little uh, little taster uh, of um, what is blockchain. But um, Charlotte, can you sort of, uh, I suppose for in the, our layman's terms, could you tell us really what is blockchain? So that, that too was a good introduction to blockchain and that was put out by the World Economic Forum. So it just shows how wide the interest goes in blockchain. Um, it's not just your, your tech enthusiasts locked in a, a dark cupboard. Um, as you would imagine, and, and people who have heard of blockchain often think, oh, A, it sounds very complex, and B, oh, is it something to do with that Bitcoin that's only used by drug traffickers and murderers and, you know, the sort of the dark, shady underworld. I think that's where the, the understanding stops for a lot of people. So I'm going to try and, and, and explain it in very simple terms because, to me, blockchain is much like the internet or email, it's there, we use it all the time, every day, far too often in my case. But um, we don't know, well most of us don't know how it works, what the underpinnings are, what the plumbing is, if you like, So, and we don't need to know that because, because it just works. So um, essentially the blockchain is a form of a distributed, um, a distributed ledger technology and it's decentralised, they're two of its key um, components if you like and I'm going to sort of answer your question what is blockchain by telling you a story about apples if you like so um, with blockchain um, I have a neighbor and my story is I, I live next door to my neighbor he's you know a nice guy um, he seems okay I don't really know him but but I want to transact with him I want to sell him an apple so I have the apple in my hand and I give him the apple. He has the apple. We know who owns the apple. He has it. He gives me some money. So, so that's done and dusted. Um, but then he says to me the next day, actually, I'd, I'd like you to sell me a, a digital apple. I say, okay, all right. How are we going to do that? I take a photo of the apple um, and send him a, a JPEG file. And um, he says, thank you. He has that. But then I send it on to 10 of my friends as well. And then I decide to keep a copy of it myself. Um, so this is the problem that blockchain is technology um, was introduced to and is trying and has solved is, is the double spending problem of digital assets. So with physical assets we know, you know, I have the car or, or the apple or whatever, but um, with digital assets and transferring physical assets in a digital way, um, we need to stop this double spending problem. 
Um, so this is the fundamental problem that some of the brightest minds in computer science have been trying to solve for decades. And back to the, the Apple story, the solution is we, we use a trusted third party. Um, and you would have heard that referred to in, in the little video clip we saw quite a bit. So this trusted third party, party in, in the Apple situation is, is our, our friend Judith who lives up the road. She's very trustworthy. She has a great bun. She's an accountant. She must be trustworthy, right? Um, you, know, we, you know, she doesn't seem to go out very late at night. She, she has a dog that protects her house and she locks her house. So we, we think that she, she's pretty trustworthy. So what she does is she keeps a record of who has the digital apple on a piece of paper or a spreadsheet. We don't care. She, just, she keeps a record of it and she keeps that safe you know, while she's knitting at night and, and playing with her abacus and, and doing trustworthy worthy things like that. Um, so that's essentially how our global commerce system works now and, and has done for the last few decades. Um, I guess the fundamental concept is we, we don't trust each other um, enough to transact directly, so we go through a trusted third party. So if you think of a bank, government, um, you know, even Uber, Airbnb, maybe not Facebook anymore, um, but so we, uh, lawyers, accountants, so... Um, this is what the blockchain solved. And about, what well, it was 10 years ago, 2008, around the time of the financial crisis, a, a man or a group of people or a, someone going under a pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto um, invented this clever solution, this code, and it was a mixture of code and gamification and cryptography and other fancy computer words that I won't bore you with. But basically, they called it Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's open source, which means that it's out there in the public and, and you can change it, I can change it, anybody can sort of get involved and, and move it around with consensus from all the other people on the network. Um, it's digital cash and it's a way of transferring value, so not just money, you can transfer anything of value from one person to another. Um, so that solved the, the double spending problem, how to transfer digital assets between people in, in this digital world. Um, so, how does it work? Like I said before, it's a very clever combination of cryptography and all these other um, technological things. So instead of trusting your, your bank or your lawyer or the government or Facebook or whatever with your data, with, your, um, with everything, um, you now go from person to person. It's, it's peer to peer. So it's directly from me to you. There's no middleman um, there. And um, yeah. Well, I think uh, I like Ledger. We all know Ledgers uh, and, and love them, but we also think of them as being, um, you know, double, two sides to a Ledger, double entry Debit accounting, and credit. credits. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with distributed Ledger technology, how is that different? Well, so like I said, um, the blockchain is peer-to-peer, -peer, so it's distributed and it's decentralised. So the, um, the decentralised part means, again, there's no no middleman or woman or institution, trusted third party, as it was referred to um, in the, the video clip there, the YouTube clip. Um, the decentralized part of it means that uh, there is, a, so if we go back to our example with Judith and the apple and the neighbor and the bun and the accountant before. Um, so when Judith updates the ledger, say my neighbor then decided to sell you the copy, Geraldine, of the, the digital ap uh, apple. Um, so Judith would update the ledger accordingly and because it's decentralized, everyone else on the network, and anyone can get on the network, all you have to do is download some software, and um, then you two can get into that blockchain network. So, you know, you could have 20 or 30,000 people who are interested in our large neighborhood and trading apples. Um, and when the transaction takes place, instead of it just being on a central computer or hub or one organization that's um, prone to being hacked or attacked or whatever, it's every single node, which they're known as technically, or every single person on that network, their copy of the ledger is updated simultaneously. So, so it all happens. Copy, yeah, exactly same, the yeah. same copy. So we're all seeing the same thing. It's updated all at once. So if, um, sorry, I can't see your name there. So if Kevin wanted to hack in and steal the digital apple and, and change the ledger, he would need to go in and change 50, you know, over 50% of everybody's lead, copies of the ledger 
exactly at the same time. So it makes it incredibly robust and tamper-proof, which is one of the amazing benefits of the blockchain. So if you imagine a picture, instead of there being a dot in the middle and everyone hooked into the central middle hub, like um, spokes in a wheel, instead everybody's connected to each other and everything's updating at exactly the same time. Yeah, okay. It's pretty amazing, really. Yeah. And you touched on Bitcoin, and uh, I think we've all heard of Bitcoin. I mean, I even had my nine-year-old son ask me about Bitcoin about two weeks ago. I thought, okay learning some different things in school these days, but uh, how does Bitcoin, um, you know, differ from blockchain? I mean, you sort of touched on it a little bit, but yeah. How does it interact? How does it relate to blockchain? Bitcoin. Okay, well, I think it's a really important distinction to make because um, blockchain is a technology and Bitcoin is the way people use it. So they're two very different things. So the original concept that released by Satoshi Nakamoto or you know whoever he or she or, or they are, um, that was the first in-use case of, of the blockchain. So block, but the blockchain is the technology that underlies Bitcoin. But Bitcoin, um, we'll talk a bit about Bitcoin. So it is um, digital cash, if you like. Um, and like I said before, when people hear of Bitcoin, they're like, oh, you know, drugs, um, bad things, dark web. And, and it has had a lot of bad press. Um, a lot of people are, you know, really into it. They think it's amazing. Um, it, its price fluctuates incredibly. I don't know if you're following the, the news around about Christmas time. And, and when I think back about this time last year, everyone was excited because Bitcoin was worth a thousand US dollars because it had gone up to next, from next to nothing. Um, like, oh, you know, I've made a fortune, a thousand US dollars. By Christmas time, it was at 20,000 US dollars for one Bitcoin. Um, and then now it's back to around $10,000. But there are there are a lot of people who have, have made a lot of money out of it, but it is, um, it's very rocky in terms of its value. It's quite a speculative instrument. Um, different countries have had different reactions to it from a regulatory point of view. Um, I, I heard someone say the other day, actually, it was banned in China, but then um, some you know, expert in the field made a comment, well, you know, anything China has banned in the past, be it you know, Facebook, Uber, Twitter, has turned into an actual an absolute cash cow and people have made a fortune off it. So if China have banned it, you should invest in it. So, yeah. But I mean, there have been, um, I think the thing with Bitcoin is, um, and again, keep it very separate from blockchain, that they're two different things. I think Bitcoin may or may not be a flash in a pan, but certainly it's used in terms of um, people invest in it to, to make money. Mm -hmm. um, however, blockchain is a technology that, that many people say, and I don't think they're wrong, it's here to stay and it's going to, to shape the, the future for us. So, so apart from your, you know, selling uh, apples and digital apples to neighbours, etc., um, how else, how, have you got some examples of how blockchain is actually being used today? Yeah, well, um, there are more and more, um, I think what you spoke before about the, the conference that I went to in New York, which is called Consensus, which is a, a a meeting of you know all the minds from you know academics, um, technology people, people in business, banks, governments, all with an interest in blockchain, and that's how wide the interest is from all around the world. It was huge, and they were all talking about different use cases for blockchain. And there were lots of what was called um, proof of work, and that they were developing, and, and it wasn't quite ready to go live. Amazing examples, and I can talk to some of them. Um, obviously, Bitcoin is the the main first solid um, actual being used example of um, blockchain. Uh, there is Everledger. Has anyone heard of Everledger? No? Okay, well that was uh, started maybe a couple of years ago by an Australian woman called Leanne Kemp. And it is basically to track the, um, the provenance, if you like, of diamonds to make sure they're not blood diamonds. So from when they're, they're mined right through to when they, they reach where they go, it's also used for insurance purposes. Apparently a diamond has something like a 40-point a fingerprint and um, it's very easy if you are in the business of manufacturing synthetic diamonds to copy you know, a diamond that you might think is this beautiful sort of $20,000, $15 million diamond. It's very easy to copy it, but um, this 40-point fingerprint 
can be stored on the blockchain and also the provenance of where the diamond has come from, when it's gone to, who owns it, um, can be traced right through the blockchain as well. So Everledger is um, one example. I mean, the list of uh, things that it can be used for, for example, and, and this hasn't gone live yet, improve the delivery of foreign aid. Like, you know, when we give money to earthquake victims or famine, for, you know, whatever, any for any reason at all, I mean, I, it's easy to be a bit sceptical about how much is actually getting there in the end. Blockchain technology will enable us to track it step by step by step to see that the money you have donated is ending up where you expect at the end. And then there are these things called smart contracts, which um, can be programmed into the blockchain, which basically automate whatever condition has been programmed in at the time. So um, a smart con a contract could be programmed in to say when it reaches, you know, this organisation or, or these people or, or purchases bricks for that well, then the funds are released from a trust account. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but also well, uh, uh, voting is another thing, you know, democracy. It's not just about, there's a lot of talk about blockchain being used in the financial services industry because um, it's transparent and that everyone, like I said before, can log in and see what is on there. You can all see at the same time. So it's transparent. It's so fast. There's no, um, you know, two or three day settlement like we have yeah. now with securities. Um, so um, the, the Australian Stock Exchange, as an example, has committed to replace their settlement system, Chess, with a blockchain based system. So it'll be, um, you know, a lot faster, more efficient, uh, may even allow instant settlement on securities. Um, another really interesting example is, um, and if we could just play the, the little clip here, is IBM and the giant shipping company Maersk, and they're, they're, launching a, um, they're launching a blockchain solution later this year, which we'll just watch the little IBM blurb on, to basically um, cut down on fraud and increase efficiencies across the supply chain for all these shipping containers. So they can explain it better than I can, so we'll just... And the, and the man has a nicer accent. The following is a demonstration of how IBM and Maersk are partnering to digitize and simplify global trade using blockchain to create trust and transparency in the supply chain. Global trade functions much as it has since the introduction of the shipping container in 1956. Manual paper-based processes are still common and information about the status of goods is locked away in organizational silos. Today, 90% of goods in global trade are carried by the shipping industry, with the supply chain slowed by the complexity and sheer volume of point-to-point -point communication across a loosely coupled web of land transportation providers, freight forwarders, customs brokers, governments, ports and ocean carriers. IBM and Maersk are addressing this problem with a distributed, permission platform accessible by the supply chain ecosystem designed to exchange event data and handle document workflows. Maersk and IBM are employing blockchain technology to create a global, tamper-proof system for digitizing trade workflow and tracking shipments end-to-end, -end, eliminating frictions including costly point-to-point -point communications. The collaboration will launch with the potential ability to track millions of container journeys per year and integrate with customs authorities on selected trade lanes. In a recent test by Maersk, Shipping a single container of flowers from Kenya to the port of Rotterdam resulted in a stack of nearly 200 communications. Using this example, we will examine how blockchain has been implemented to create trust and security in the digitized document workflow and improve the efficiency of global supply chains. Here we can see each distinct entity involved in the transaction, the growers, export authorities, ports, customs and importers. Shipping from the port of Mombasa requires signatures from three different agencies approving the export and six documents that describe the origin, chemical treatments, quality of the produce and customs duties. Firstly, using a PC or mobile device, the Kenyan farm submits a packing list that becomes visible to all participants. This action initiates a smart contract that enforces an export approval workflow between the three agencies. As each agency signs, the status is updated for all to see. Simultaneously, information about the inspection of the flowers, the sealing of the refrigerated container, the pickup by the trucker, and the approval from customs is communicated to the port of Mombasa, allowing them to prepare for the container. All actions relating to the documents and the physical goods are captured and shared, which documents were submitted, when and by whom, 
where the flowers are and who is in possession of them and the next steps in their journey. Flowers are perishable, so it's crucial that there are no delays or missteps. Blockchain provides secure data exchange and a tamper-proof repository for these documents and shipping events. This system could significantly reduce delays and fraud, saving billions of dollars annually. And according to the WTO, reducing barriers within the international supply chain could increase worldwide GDP by almost 5% and total trade volume by 15%. For more information on how IBM can help make blockchain right for your business, please visit ibm.com slash blockchain. And apologies for the little IBM plug at the end. I'm not from IBM and have no affiliation with them, but um, I thought that explained quite well how they were trying to do what what they're trying to do. It will save their business money. They they claim it will save um, you know increase GDP and and increase the the volumes of trade. So I mean all that is is great. Just talking about you asked me about you know real use cases yeah. of blockchain. Um, that I know I was saying they're not just financial cases, but also um, and something that really hit a chord with me when when I was at Consensus in New York was just the the social um, push. Um, I think there is a a move and a sentiment globally that people are becoming less and less trustworthy of these large institutions that that have our data that that hold a, a disproportionate amount of power. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about governments, although you know there are governments that are definitely corrupt that that take advantage of their citizens. But you know, look at, at the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica at the moment, and the amount of data that they hold. And these large corporations and others are just increasing in size, and they are the trusted middlemen that we talk about. Um, um, blockchain, um, some of the social solutions are about in developing nations making sure that there is a fair voting system, um, you know, voting using the blockchain. Um, so, uh, financial inclusion is a huge one. Blockchain and Bitcoin, when combined, they give people in developing nations all they need is a smartphone in their hand, and all of a sudden they have access to, to markets. You know, they can sell their goods anywhere in the world. They're no longer just um, confined to their, their little area where they can't get access. The nearest bank is a 100 mile walk away. They can't get to that bank, so they're, they're destined for a life of poverty. But with their <coughs> smartphone now and the blockchain and, and um, Bitcoin as well, they can sell things overseas and people can remit money back to their um, Bitcoin wallet in their phone. They have that, that's financial inclusion right there, and that's how we, we help, um, and or well, not we, that's how developing nations develop and how we increase prosperity for, for everybody. Um, you know, those sorts of things are fantastic. Also, the number of people in the world, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but um, people from war-torn nations and, and um, oppressed regimes that, that don't actually have any paperwork for their identity. So they can't travel, they can't buy a house, they can't own land, they, you know, they can never get out of their cycle of poverty. But to have some kind of digital identity system held on the blockchain that can't be, um, your, your corrupt government officials can't reach in and, and, and delete your identity from the central system. It's a global um, decentralized network system. I mean, that, that's life changing for these people. Yeah, so there's lots of good examples there, and I, and I think um, you, so when you touched on some of the things for government, but uh, when you're talking about registers and I suppose things like um, land titles, and there's probably uh, lots of things from a government perspective as yeah. well that it can do. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, land land titles, also government information sharing is a really big one. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of silos in the government with information, and it's very difficult, and uh, you know laws around privacy and all the rest. But but putting the regulatory um, part of it aside, um, you know, it, this enables different government agencies, the blockchain, because of its decentralised nature, to share information between them. Mm -hmm. Also, um, regulation in terms of you have real-time information, so no longer do, are the government um, agencies and the regulators getting information, you know, three, six, twelve months after the fact. They have that information in real time. It's transparent. They too can look into the the network and, and they can see. And then instead of saying, actually, you made this mistake three years ago and it's now 
you know, screwed up our whole financial system, they can say, hey, you know, what's what's going on here? And, and you know, work with their uh, constituents, if you like, to help remedy the, the issue or understand it as opposed to looking back down the track and we already have a big mess. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, so uh, it's, yeah it's huge for governments as well. Yeah. So you've touched on, um, obviously, around transparency. Um, what, what other benefits do you see from blockchain? I mean, we've talked about financial inclusion, transparency. Are there other benefits from it? Yeah, well, uh, efficiency. Um, like I spoke before about the, the example of the ASX um, replacing the chess system, um, instant settlement or, you know, settlement in hours as opposed to days. But think of the costs saved there. Um, so a huge amount of efficiency as well. Less parties need to be involved in a transaction. Um, trust is no longer uh, through a third party who you may or may not trust, and increasingly it's becoming may not. Trust is now digitised. It's you, you trust the, the, the system. Um, and, and I go from, from you to me instead of through through this middleman. So in terms of business, that's a huge, a huge advantage there. Um, I think by increasing trust, stakeholders have more confidence as well, which is great. And in terms of individuals as well, um, it's hard to get your head around, and I know I find it difficult myself, but um, if you are able to control your information um, and you can choose using the blockchain which part of it you release to whomever and, and whenever, you don't have to um, you know, sign up to, to Twitter and give away all your information. You release what you want to when you want to. Your digital identity is yours. Think of it as a black box. So um, you want to show someone that you can drive instead of having to show your driver's license that's come from one government agency um, that has your, your name, address, date of birth, hair colour, eye colour, all of this information that actually do they need to know that or do they just need to know that you passed a driving test and you can drive. So you give out you know, pieces of information when you choose to, your information, your data is yours and no big central entity, no government, no um, you know, Facebook or Twitter or you know, Amazon or whoever own that, it's yours. So yes, there yeah, are some okay. huge benefits. Now we talked, um, I think you said 2008, uh, you know, we started off with Bitcoin and um, Nakamoto, um, start, you know, it all it sort of started to kick off then. Now there's been a lot of hype, a lot of talk. I mean, we've now, you know, 10 years have passed. Do you think blockchain will live up to the hype or is it just the, the latest sort of bubble, uh, you know, that we're talking about in terms of, in terms of tech? Yeah, it, it's... Um I mean, I can't say definitively. Yeah, we won't hold obviously. you to it. We're not going to... A hundred witnesses. <laughs> yeah, please don't. But um, it's been called the most important IT invention of our age. Um, and people are saying, well, you know, blockchain is now what the internet was 20 years ago. Um, I think there was... In 2015 and 16, one billion dollars invested in the um, by venture capitalists in the blockchain ecosystem, and that number is said to have doubled every year since then. So there's a huge and huge amount of interest. People are, um, you know, some of the brightest minds are um, are getting in behind it. There's, um, for example, Blythe Masters, who's a, you know, sort of hot on the the blockchain circuit, if you like. She um, she was the um, like the the CFO of, of JP Morgan and she was um, you know she was very successful in her career in an investment bank and she left and started a blockchain startup as, as have many of the, the brightest minds. Um, there are governments, you know, Data 61 in yep. Australia is behind it. Um, in the UK the government's behind it. Um, you know, all around the world, governments, bankers, um, the banks themselves are really getting into it because they don't want to be disrupted and get left behind. So they're bringing a lot of the startups in house and working in collaboration with them. So no, I don't think it's a it's a bubble. I think I think it's you know, you know, two years, five years. I think the the question is more just a matter of of when um, it's going to happen, but it definitely will happen. Yeah, okay. You think you spoke about um, you know RPA ro robot process automation before. You know, five or ten years ago, people would have, you know, that sounded like something from a sci-fi um, movie. But nowadays, it's real. It's happening in our finance functions, and I think we'll see the same with blockchain. Yeah. yeah. So you, you also just talked about um, the reg like regulators and, and giving access to information earlier. Um, but where we're talking about um, 
basically the two parties and not having that intermediary. Will we need regulators? Will we need third parties um, in, with, with blockchain? What will the role be of a, of a regulator? Look, I'd like to say there'll be no regulators, Geraldine, but I don't think <laughs> I don't think that will be the case. I think we'll we'll always need regulators um, because they are there to to protect the public interest. And I I think that um, while the way they regulate will change definitely, will need to change in order for them to remain relevant. Um, there'll always be a role for regulators. So I think, um, as I said just their role is going to change. So instead of them standing over those they regulate with a stick, um, because technologies such as blockchain are just changing so quickly and all the time, you get your head around one and then something else pops up or it's different. So regulators are just need, are going to need to and already are needing to approach this from a different angle. So they will need to get in there and, and collaborate and learn with those they regulate. Um, you know, they're going to need to be one step ahead because most people um, that they regulate are going to want to do things the right way, but there'll be some that are a bit sneaky and, and not. So they need to be really tech savvy. So I think the regulator of blockchain and of the future and other um, different types of technology, instead of being your traditional lawyer or accountant, they're going to need to be a software engineer with a bit of the other stuff in there as well. Then they're, they're going to need to understand what's going on so that they, they can regulate it. So. Yeah, I think there's always a need for regulators, but regulation is going to look different because it will just have to be so dynamic and agile to adjust to this technology-driven future that, that we're in now. Sounds like a good idea for a future ink paper. Well, no, you <laughs> On it, regulation, does it not? Yes. Just giving a little plug. Uh, uh, Charlotte actually wrote a paper earlier this year around the... Uh, well, sorry, late last year, around the regulator of 2030 and what they, the regulator may look like in, in the sort of you know, digital and technology space. So, yeah, it's yeah. actually a really good read, if I must say so myself. So <laughs> have a look on our website for it. But certainly, I mean, that is, as technology changes, so too um, must regulation in the way governments, and, and we all do things. I think agile is the key word there and adaptable. So, yeah. yeah. So you, you mentioned um, the, the price of Bitcoin. So we we're talking, you know, a thousand dollars, whatever it was, you know, a while ago. Now we're talking, we're talking twenty thousand. We're talking ten thousand. So uh, anyone in the room that was lucky enough to uh, to get in on this, I know it wasn't me, but uh, if anyone did, I mean, what happens with tax? Like, uh, you know, is it is it a currency, or do we? How, how do we how do we deal with? Uh, these lovely gains that we may or may not have um, made? Oh, it was may not in my case as well, Geraldine. Um, but that's a good question and, and it's one I bet any accountants in the room who are in practice must be hearing more and more because it's certainly as, as people get more involved with... There are other digital currencies as well. Ethereum is another um, increasingly popular one with a platform that's... Um, you know, similar but different to Bitcoin, uh, blockchain, sorry, I won't go into that now. But certainly if, um, in regards to tax, I would say that, and I'm no tax expert also, I'd like to point out, but the tax treatment differs from, from country to country and even within a country from year to year. So for example, here in Australia, um, the ATO came out with um, some guidance in, in terms of Bitcoin and the tax of it um, earlier this year, quite recently, I think, um, a couple of weeks ago, and they said that um, in their mind that at the moment, um, they were very careful with their wording, but at the moment, um, Bitcoin is to be treated like like an asset, if you like, in terms of, of tax. Um, so uh, and for capital gains, so any capital gains on it, if you're trading, will, will be taxed accordingly. And if it's a, a private use, you know, if you're using it for private use, then it won't much like with cash. But in terms of GST. Um, a couple of years ago, um, and that it only stopped recently, um, there was double taxation on Bitcoin, which put a lot of people off using it and trading it for, for GST. So you'd pay GST when you purchased your Bitcoin, and then when you'd go and spend it, you'd then pay GST again. So there was double taxation, which, um, you know, for a sort of a nascent technology and um, well, sort of currency, I'll use the, the term loosely, that's very off-putting if you have to pay tax on it twice. And there was a huge uproar from the fledgling Bitcoin community, you know, it's hard enough to get out of the shadow of being a drug dealing sort of, you know, dodgy currency, um, that, that people were being double taxed. So with, with lobbying and then looking at what was going on in um, what they called more progressive nations um, in the rest of the world, then um, their lobbying was successful and from, I think it was mid last year, that was overturned and actually now you only pay GST once, so yeah, only okay. when you spend it, so yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Um, that's probably lots of questions from me, but I'm not sure whether uh, anyone on the floor actually might have a question. I can see some hands. We've got microphones, I think, so. Thank you. Um, thanks for sharing. Really interesting. My name is Harry Huang. And just a quick question around uh, blockchain technologies. So in the last 10 years, has it ever been cracked? That's my first question. And then related to your sharing about the village or the neighborhood that you had in the Apple store, really like that story. Um, what happened if there's more untrusted people than trusted people in that village? Yeah. Let's say out of the 100 neighbors, there's 99 people who are all untrusted and there's only one that is trusted. Would that break or take that block change? Are you an auditor? Professionally Just to share a little bit, because I'm, I'm actually having a talk to about 200 students next week about blockchain and, and Bitcoin. I'm a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's still thing that I'm still Concentration not sure. of power, bad power, you're asking exactly. about. So I actually read the paper from Satoshi um, Nakamoto at least 10 times. Wow. Um, there's, there's that bit mathematical uh, calculation that I still about sort of 60% understanding. So I really try to understand that um, probabilities um, and try to figure out with that assumption, what happens if it doesn't happen? Um, so, sorry, the first part of your question was... Has it been hacked? Up? Has it, ever, oh, been has it ever been hacked? Okay. And in relation to that, has the blockchain ever been hacked? As far as I understand, no. However, there have been... You would have heard of Mt. Gox, which was a... Um, an exchange in, in Japan and others. There have been instances of, um, of exchanges being hacked into which are, are different. They are places that sort of facilitate um, buying and selling of Bitco Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, in order to buy Bitcoin, you need a, a normal bank account for what we call fiat cash, which is just normal money. And then um, the exchange sort of facilitates the, the purchase and sale. And in, in terms of regulation and buying Bitcoin, you can't regulate Bitcoin because it's a digital, it's nothing, you know, it's a the transfer of value, like I said, on, on the blockchain ledger, but you don't, I don't give you anything, so there's nothing that can be regulated. However, the exchanges can be regulated. Some of them in, in different countries have different rules about that and different laws. Some are great, some are not so great, and so some of those exchanges have been hacked into and Bitcoin has been stolen. But the blockchain, um, as far as I'm aware, no. Yeah. And the second part of your question, so you have a, you know, 99 or 100 people you said and, and 99 of them are, are bad people and they you know want to corrupt the network um i guess in theory that that is possible um but they'd all have to want to do the same thing because the whole concept um underlying the cryptography which is oh i won't get into detail but underlying how transactions are added to the block is that every 10 minutes these people that are called miners um, they are people who, who have the software and who are part of the network. They sort of rush in and they verify these transactions using this fancy maths called cryptography and add it to the block. And then they get what's called consensus or agreement from over half of, of everyone else in the network. And they are sort of distributed all around the world. That's the distributed part. So you would have to you know, get them all to agree all these random people to agree at exactly the same time, exactly the same thing. Um, I don't see how that's physically impossible and I think that's the beauty of the blockchain and mm. why it has solved this double spending problem mm. because um, it's, yeah. you know, just and not if, possible. And if I would put a, a, an assumption in there, would I say to be fair, we assume that there'd be 50% more good people than bad people in the world. Is that, is 40, that a fair assumption? Well, I don't think it's more about good and bad because if you think about if you wanted to tamper with the blockchain and you wanted to do x you'd all have to want to do exactly the same x at exactly the same time so i'm um, first of all i think there probably are more good people than bad people in the world i think so too <laughs> yeah i hope there are um but you'd have to have um that's like saying all bad people want the same thing, but they, you'd have to have all the bad people organised enough at exactly the same time to make exactly the same change, and I don't think the bad people are that organised, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you for your question. There's another, um, Deb right behind you, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I only understand a little bit about the blockchain, but my understanding is recently it's become very hard to transact because it's so big, and therefore the immediacy of it has reduced. <coughs> 
because if, if I think about it like a ledger, the ledger becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And we have this problem in ourselves, like our files become bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, is that a problem of architecture? Because then I think of something like a land um, database in a government use. Eventually, doesn't it break down unless you have huge compute power because um, the ledger just became, becomes so huge with trading? Or is that a problem particular to the blockchain architecture that can be overcome with other applications with different architecture? Um, I, uh, in terms of slowing down and then pushing transaction costs up because of the slowdown, you're right, it has, and it has. But I think you're ta talking, um, you know, instead of an hour, it's an hour, two minutes, um, and you're comparing it to settlement now of, well, you, a really big use case for blockchain that I didn't mention when Geraldine asked before, or I kind of did, did was international remittance. Um, so sending money overseas, so you have workers that might come from, um, you know, a very poor part of Indonesia, for example, I'm just picking a country, and they come to Australia and they come and they, I don't know, work in the mines or work on an orchard or whatever, and they send money back to their family. And for their family to get that money, they have to sort of walk for a week um, and find a Western Union branch, and it's cost 7% and it's taken, um, you know, 12 days or, or five days or whatever for the money to get there. Um, but blockchain and Bitcoin enable that to happen in an hour to their phone um, and for 2%. So um, so the incremental, it might cost 2.1% and it might take an hour five, but you know the gains are still massive when you compare it to the status quo. So the cost of the problem that it's solving are currently so big, like in the flower shipping example, there's so many things to overcome. And then in the meantime, the technology and compute power increases so yep. and solve and each other as it goes along. Yeah, and also, um, blockchain is so that was a permissioned and I don't want to confuse it but the in the Maersk IBM example that's what's called a permissioned um, blockchain so that's one that companies use inside internally um, and they use that you know the parts of the blockchain technology that are beneficial they like but it's not open to everybody in the world whereas the Bitcoin network um, and the blockchain that I've been talking to you about that is um, open source so all the code is open source so the issue you're talking about there the best and the brightest minds can sort of jump in get on and, and, and fix it up and adapt it as they go but any changes have to be agreed by the majority of the users and hopefully the good majority as we talked about before thanks for your question I understand uh some of these uh, cryptocurrencies use enough electricity to power small countries, um, particularly through m the mining of, of, of them. Um, is this a resolvable problem or is this something which is going to continue and, and, and how um, big could the problem become, I suppose? Yeah, and, and you're right, they, they do. And that's why a lot of the miners are now concentrated in places such as remote corners of China where the, the hardware that they need, these supercomputers to, to do the mining. Because the miners are the people that um, take every 10 minutes, they take a block of transactions that have happened in the last 10 minutes and using fancy maths they verify them, they get added to the block and then those miners then get um, paid in, in Bitcoin. So as Bitcoin price goes up, they, they, you know, they're all racing, racing, racing to do it. So yes, you're right, it takes a lot of electricity probably enough to power a small country like New Zealand for example and um, yeah I think that is a problem that is being worked on and because obviously electricity is, is scarce um, and um, yeah yeah so I think that that may become more of a problem I'm not sure I guess we'll just have to watch and wait but at the moment the benefits certainly outweigh the costs and as, as organizations have um, their own internal sort of permission blockchains because um, all the permission isn't needed like with the Bitcoin blockchain, then the need for all the electricity and resources less. Yeah. I, mean, touched on, I know you touched on uh, both of you on it, um, probably on one thing that is holding it back a little bit and that comes down to, to costs because just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean we're going to do it um, and, and costs in lots of ways. You know, it is quite expensive in some applications. So, not that the private one's a bit different, but some of the other um, applications are quite costly. So, and I think that might be why some of it hasn't quite broken through yet. Is yeah. 
uh, in terms of like your electricity example there, so the people who are mining, they have to pay for the electricity themselves. And if it comes down to sort of basic economics, the value they're getting from mining, they're paid in Bitcoin, obviously is outweighing the cost of the electricity and their time because they continue to do it. So they're getting more benefit than cost. It's not like the electricity comes from nowhere. They have to pay for it and they're getting more money from mining the Bitcoin than it's costing them in electricity. Uh, get one down the front here. Hi, thank you for your time today. Um, I start to ask to tack onto that question with the mining costs. So that's more of a context from a Bitcoin point of view, but how does it work if it's a private blockchain? So for example, like the IBM um, case scenario, how does the mining work or how does that, um, the algorithm work there in that case, where it's not open to the public to mine? Yeah, so it's closed and, and um, I'm not over the sort of the computer science algorithmic um, cryptography detail of how it works under the bonnet, but you're right, it's closed and it's a, um, it's a, so it's within the organisation and um, they don't need miners like they would externally. But both sides can still see, so that's, a, that's the, the beauty. So it's not like someone in IBM here is doing something and the, the, uh, the other party can't no, see. So Because they're actually yeah, can, can still, still got all those benefits, but it's just not the whole world can see, is that right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah like you're talking yeah. about, uh, so IBM were the developer of, of the MISC application, but um, you know, if it's two entities, then two entities can see. If it's five, then five. Um, and they would set up their own internal protocols as to how that exactly worked um, between their organisations. And that's where they might use, um, so I've been talking about the Bitcoin, um, the blockchain, which is the Bitcoin application, but I mentioned Ethereum before, which is also um, a, a digital currency, which is increasing, that's only been around for a couple of years, but that is also um, a blockchain platform that is, uh, able to be built on and more adaptable than the Bitcoin um, blockchain. So they all use similar concepts in that they're, um, they're decentralised and they're, they're distributed, um, they're transparent but private at the same time. They all have the same qualities but do it in a slightly different way. I'm not sure whether or not you'll be able to answer this, but are there any industries or organisations that are likely to become redundant because of this technology? I'm sure there are. Um, what the literature is saying is that it's the, the, the trusted third party or the middlemen that will need to adapt, if you like. So, you know, I can't predict if they'll become redundant per se, but certainly they'll need to change the way that they do things. Um, I think of uh, auditors, for example. Um, so, or, <laughs> the giggle in the room, but I mean, <laughs> a nervous giggle. Um, Auditors, uh, you know, add a lot of value when they do their audits, but when everything is there sort of transparent and in real time being matched off, is there a need to go and tick and bash anymore? Um, or, or let me rephrase, to verify transactions um, because they're right there, you see them right in front of you. So will auditors become redundant? I don't think so, no. Um, but they will certainly have to adapt what they do and, they, you know, they'll move further up the value chain and be able to give some, some um, you know, some insight that they didn't have the resource to do before. So I think it's the same as the whole, um, you know, the whole future of work and that things will shift. Um, some will fall off the bottom and we'll have new things coming up the top. Um, I'm not sure if... I got questions about... When, when, you, when you talk about the block chain technology, apparently people are um, giving their information, like the data as well. But you also mentioned about there's no such thing as regulator at this stage in this field. So say for example, if people are using this platform and then they're giving their um, like information and you also mentioned about the auditors as well. So if the government would like to do some sort of audit, so who have to say what sort of information can be provided or cannot be provided and who have the control? Um, I'm sure I'm you the right okay. Question. No, no, I, I get what you're saying there. So you're saying, um, so first of all, 
there will be regulators, I think, in my opinion. I think we'll always have a, a need for regulators. I just think that the role of the regulator, um, as it has been traditionally, will need to adapt and change for this new world that, that has these emerging technologies, including blockchain and, and, and many other things that probably haven't even been thought of now. So there will be a need for a regulator. Um, I think the second part of your question, you were saying, um, we put information on, on the blockchain, much as we do on the internet now, and who has control of it? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so so traditionally, if we have something on our paper, we can just hold onto it and no mm. one can see it. But now that, it's like, yeah, as you said, it's like internet. So when we're using the platform, it's out there. Even though we may want to say, well, I don't want it to expose to other party, but is that what can be controlled mm. in that way? If someone wants to have access to it, right? what is the... Uh, barrier or what is the how do you control what yes, information yes. is out there so I think that's a good question for now you know that the state of affairs now in terms of we have all this information out there and we want to sign up to X app on um, on our phone well that looks cool you know it gives us free this and that and emoticons and all I have to do is tick the box yes I agree to the terms and conditions I think the Cambridge Analytica case um, that's in the media at the moment just shows that, you know, we're signing our lives away, we're signing our data away, we have no control of it, we don't know what we're ticking. We trust these these third parties, these, these middlemen, these trusted third parties. And I think one of the, um, the issues that the blockchain is purported to be able to resolve is that it removes... That, that person that, or that organisation or entity or whatever, and I'm just transacting between myself and Geraldine, so I choose what I share with Geraldine. If I want to share my middle name with her, I, I can. Um, you know, I, I know what I'm sharing with her because I decide because it's just between Geraldine and I. I'm not having to go, you know, via you. I, I don't actually know you. You might be very trustworthy, but then you might take all my information and give it away to somebody else and um, without me knowing and get me to sign something secretly, you know, using this as an example. So you choose what you disclose in this new world. And I think the situation you're talking about is, is the current state of play where we don't know what we're giving away or what it's being used for. And our data is, um, we're giving it away for free. There's no value, someone else is commoditizing it. I suppose it comes back to the point around transparency so you can see what you've put out there as yeah. opposed to now where we don't really know what we've done because we did we that two years ago or whatever and we really don't know what yeah. data of ours is there, is it? But right. this will be more transparent and we can see exactly what is there about us. So exactly, yeah. yeah. I was just wondering, whereabouts are the blockchains actually hosted? If they're completely shared, being IT, they have to be hosted somewhere, they have to be on an IP somewhere. How is that determined? And where, say with the Bitcoin one, where would it actually sit? And yeah. does that attach responsibility to whatever is hosting it? Or is that responsibility still shared by all the participants? That's a really good question and one that I don't have the answer to, I'm sorry. All right, so there's an example in the news from a couple of days ago where um, ABC reported that uh, some images, uh, child pornography images, have been stored on Bitcoin transactions and therefore stored in the blockchain and decentralised. Um, it was raised up, the issue to be faced was that obviously people who hold block, uh, Bitcoin therefore have those images and are a breach of a number of different laws. So how do we deal with situations where blockchain <coughs> is being used for criminal purposes but unbeknownst to the people who are actually using it for the right reasons? Yeah, and, and that's one I think as technology moves and, and we have this idea of how it's going to look in our heads and go, yeah, there's this wonderful benefit and that wonderful benefit um, that we talked about before with Geraldine asked, will there be the need for a regulator? And I said, well, yes, I think there always will be. And that's an example of you know, the regulators are going to need to be all over things like that, that we, we only think up when they happen. And um, So that's going to be one of those examples where the regulators are going to need to step in and figure out a way to sort of block those those holes and figure it out. And I do believe as well that most people don't want child pornography floating around and that we talk about the, the balance of the good and, and the bad and that the good people who, who are a part of the network will, you know, step up and make that not possible. Just one more question. Um, has this been tested in our legal systems yet, either in the 
legal case, uh, people suing each other um, with that blockchain technology as well? So uh, the blockchain is the technology that facilitates transactions. So I guess that's like saying has, um, you know, SAP or whatever. So I think it's more, um, in answer to your question, no, not as far as I'm aware, but it would be not the technology perhaps that would be um, tested in the legal system, but probably the transactions that go through it using the technology. And I think because it is such a fledgling technology that, that that's still to come where we see um, cases involving blockchain technology and legal disputes. So watch this space. Okay. Um well, I think we've probably um, run out of time, but uh, thank you so much, Charlotte, for, for sharing that uh, with us today. And also thank you to all of you and for your questions. They've been great, uh, been great questions yeah, really and uh, great yeah, great questions. interaction. So thank you all for uh, attending and for your questions.